And this is, was another thing I noticed in my first video about Summer Wells, where I believe that Don and Candace have friends in very low places, dangerous people, people who might say, hey, give me your daughter or I'll kill you both because you owe me money. Or, all right, you, you can't afford your fix this week? Give me your daughter. Rent her out to me. And then something happens to her. Well, cover it up. Not my problem. And if you turn on me, I'll kill both of you and your other kids. So out here in this, things could ha be happening that would not even occur to us, um, people who are here watching YouTube videos and have the luxury of, of watching videos about education and improving our lives, which is why it's so hard to put yourself into, the, and for me, to put myself into the headspace of people like this. How important are inconsistencies? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. This is the second video in my series on Summer Wells. And today we're going to look at one of the earliest interviews with Summer Wells' parents, Don and Candace Wells. This interview was done on June 29, 2021. So it was within two weeks of when Summer went missing. I've watched the first few seconds of this and it starts off with the bang. So we're going to hit the ground running, but I've not watched the whole thing. So I'm sure much more will pop up as we go. Without further ado, let's listen. A lot. I a lot. I know she didn't walk away from this property by herself or off this yard by her swing. I feel in my heart that somebody has came up here and took her and has lured her away from here. Already we can see a huge red flag. When someone's kid goes missing they typically leave all possibilities open, and we've seen examples of this on the, on the channel. So whenever a parent or anyone is conclusive about something, I'm on alert that they might be hoaxing. And the four signs of a hoaxer that I've developed over the course of a dozen videos about ho hoaxers on the channel, these are the four signs. Conclusiveness. Vagueness about the money shot, reticence about the money shot, and they are emotionless. And by money shot, I mean the subject of the hoax. So in the case of Bob Gimley, it's when he saw Bigfoot. That's the money shot. Or in the case of Bob Lazar, when he saw the UFO, that's the money shot. Or the McCanns, when they talk about going into the room and discovering that Madeline was missing. That's the money shot. In other words, the money shot is the part they have to sell you on if they are lying, if they want to convince you that they're not making up the story. And typically the money shot makes up maybe 1% of the entire story, right? So they might be telling the truth 99% of the time, but that 1%, that crucial bit where everything changes, that's the money shot. And that's where we need to check if they're lying or not. And already we can see that Candace is being very conclusive about Summer being kidnapped. So listen to her again. Listen to how conclusive she is. This is within two weeks of Summer going missing. For all she knows, if she doesn't know anything, Summer could have wandered off. Um, a coyote could have taken her. Um, a dingo, like that story in Australia. Any number of things could have happened, including an abduction. But she, just like the McCanns, is insistent that it was an abduction, which is the red flag, the big sign of a hoax. And then the question is, if she is hoaxing us, why? Why make up a story? So let's listen from the top. A lot. I know she didn't walk away from this property by herself. I know she didn't walk away from this property. How could she possibly know that? According to her, she she was not looking when Summer disappeared. She turned her attention off of Summer for two minutes and Summer was gone. So how could she know Summer didn't walk off the property? If she didn't actually know what happened, 
or she didn't have an agenda, that should still be a possibility. In fact, it should be the top possibility, the most likely scenario. But she discounts it entirely. Herself or off this yard by her swing. I feel in my heart that somebody has came up here and took her, has lured her away from here. Me and my mother and her were planting flowers. All right, so here's the money shot. Now Candace is going to tell us about the moment where Summer vanished. Remember, if this is a hoax, we can expect conclusiveness, vagueness about the money shot, reticence about getting to the money shot, and emotionless. And by emotionless, I mean reported emotion. So a psychopath or a liar can, lie, can cry or get hysterical or get angry when they're telling their story. But it's very rare that they're in the mindset to actually make up the emotions they would have felt if they were actually in that situation. And that is how you catch liars. And I've seen lots of comments of people telling me that the behavior panel thinks that uh, Don and Candace Wells might not be guilty. And I think that's because they rely on body language, whereas I totally discount it. So if Candace does not report the appropriate emotions here, I don't care if she's crying, weeping, um, you know, acting like she can't even stand up. She's about to faint. If she doesn't report the right emotions, then my antenna for a hoax goes up. I do not care at all what her or Don's body language says. Because manipulators and liars are great at faking body language. They are not great, and in fact, nobody is, at placing themselves in a situation that they weren't actually in. And like I often say, even Hollywood blockbusters with multiple writers of scripts, unlimited budgets, unlimited time to make a movie, still have plot holes. So imagine the plot holes and inconsistencies a story will have if two amateur, low IQ drug addicts come up with it on the spot, it's probably going to have a lot of plot holes. And we're about to pick them all apart right here together. And Also, you might know something different about me in today's video. I got a haircut, but I'm also wearing my new hat. It says stay true and it's got the little DD badge. So let me know if you guys like it. All right, here we go. We went in after we got done washing our hands, and she got a piece of candy from Grandma, and she wanted to go back over and see her brothers, and I said, okay, and I walked her all the way over to the porch, and I watched her walk into the kitchen where the boys were watching TV, and I told the boys, I said, watch Summer, I'll be back. And within two minutes, I came back, and I asked the boys where their sister was, and they said, she went downstairs, mom. Already, this is the money shot. Like I said, this is the most important part of the story. If Summer were actually kidnapped, you would expect Candace to be racking her brains right now. Did I see anyone come up the path? Did the dogs bark? Did my mother say anything? Um... Did we hear any weird noises? Did I hear a car along the road? Uh, did I see uh, Summer turn left or right when she got in the house to go to the staircase or to go into the kitchen? But none of these things are occurring to her to say because, in my opinion, this never happened. It has all the hallmarks of a scripted hoax story in that it's vague. We are planting flowers. She talks about what she said to the boys, but then she doesn't tell us what she did for those two minutes. So she says, watch the boy. She tells the boys to watch Summer. Then she goes and does something, but she doesn't tell us what she did. And then she tells us she came back to the boys. It's almost like a movie script where the camera's focused on the door and you're looking through the door at the boys in the kitchen. When in reality, she's telling it from us from her perspective. She should be telling us what she did after she told the boys to watch Summer. So it's vague and it's reticent in that Summer went missing at some point. She's telling us all these details about plan planting flowers and her grandma giving her a candy. I want to hear 
about any noises she heard, any what happened that made her suspect Summer was missing. His mom to play with her toys in the playroom. I said, okay. So listen again. All right, let's just back up. She says that she left, she came back, but she doesn't tell us what she did when she left. In TV. And I told the boys, I said, watch Summer. I'll be back. And within two minutes, I came back. Okay, so watch Summer. I'll be back. Within two minutes, I came back. What did she do during those two minutes? If she's telling us what she was doing, you would expect her to say, I told the boys, watch Summer. I'll be back. I went back to help uh, my mom pack up all the gardening tools. And then I came back. But she tells this almost like someone told her her script. Almost like Don sat down with her and came up with a script. It reminds me a lot of the Kate and Jerry McCann um, scripted story. I believe they also came up with a scripted story to push their hoax. And here, if just listen to how bizarre that is. I told the boys to watch Summer. And then I came back two minutes later. She should be telling us what she did do during those two minutes if this actually happened to her. I went to go pack up the gardening tools. I looked out at the road. I saw a car on the road. Or I looked out the road. I didn't see anything. But, but those two minutes are just missing. Kind of like a movie script when one character goes off screen and you're still watching the other characters. That's not how you tell a story about yourself if you're the character who walked off screen. I hope that's making sense, just how bizarre this is. And I'm surprised more people are not pointing this out. After I made my first Summer Wells video, I had lots of comments of people telling me, uh, you know, that they're so glad to have me looking at this. To me, this looks like a laydown. I'm very surprised that I'm one of the few people uh, with training in this stuff who, who is seeing how obvious this is. It's very concerning, actually. Watching TV. And I told the boys, I said, watch Summer. I'll be back. And within two minutes, I came back. Watch Summer. I'll be back. Within two minutes, I came back. Also, if, you're, if you pre-ordered the Deception deck, stuff like that, like within two minutes, I came back, is going to be one of the cards. I'm working on Deception deck now, so hopefully ship according to the, the time I have on the website right now. So if you haven't pre-ordered, it's 20% off right now during the pre-sale at DeceptionDeck.com. But that is called a temporal lacune, when someone skips over time. I told the boys to watch Summer. Bum, 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 beep, beep, beep. Within two minutes, I came back. It's skipping over two minutes. Why? I want to know what happened during those two minutes. So when someone says like next or suddenly or around that time, or after that, any word that indicates a jump over time, and let's say someone does that to you in your own personal life, you know, like, uh, you know, where were you yesterday? Why did you come home late? Well, I was at work. After I got in my car, well, you let them say it and then come back to that. What do you mean after? You were at work and then after what? What happened, right? So when someone uses a temporal lacuna, let them continue talking, let them lock in their timeline, and then circle back and figure out what they skipped over now that you've locked them into a timeline. And it's frustrating no one did that to them here. I think this early on in the case, they had a rough script for their story, but they didn't have it totally nailed down. And in the McCanns, I think a similar thing happened. Early on in the case, they would not even answer questions about what happened that day because they said it could affect the investigation, which is nonsense. But then later in later interviews, the McCanns were much more comfortable about saying what happened when Kate checked the room and discovered Madeline was missing because they had time to script their story out to the uh, to get their story straight, to lock in the details they wanted to go with. And then the sign of a scripted story is that those details in that story did not change over the course of years. There was no reminiscence effect. And I've got two videos about scripted stories, so I'm not going to belabor the point here. But already, this looks to me like a deceptive story because we have a temporal lacunae. She's not telling us what happened during those two minutes. 
and it looks scripted in that it's very vanilla and it's very vague. And I asked the boys where their sister was and they said she went downstairs mom to play with her toys in the playroom. I said okay. And I yelled downstairs for her a couple times and I didn't get no answer. Which was unusual because usually she always answers me. And so I went down there to check and she was nowhere in sight. She was just gone. I don't go on walks around here or runs because I'm scared of the bears and snakes. All right. So I have not even watched this far in. She said she's scared of bears and snakes. How does she know, not know that a bear didn't take Summer away? Why is that not a real possibility? Why is she certain Summer was kidnapped? That's the big question. When someone comes up with a hoax... The first step is to recognize that you're being hoaxed. The second step is to recognize why the hoax. In my first Summer Wells video, where I looked at the 10 weirdest statements that Don Wells made, when I knew very, very little about this case, I was noting all the instances of him talking about Summer being dead. Uh, whenever he mentioned Summer, he mentioned, you know, like, um, it killed her when I said mean things to her, or she loved me to death. And those death references, A, could have been leakage. So it could have been him accidentally leaking that she's dead. So accidentally revealing that he knows she's dead. Or I considered after I re-listened listened back to the video, it could be him pushing a narrative, him pushing the idea that she's dead, in which case he could be hoaxing that she's dead. The hoax could be that she's dead. If that's the narrative he's pushing, it means that she might still be alive. And in that first video, I left open the possibility that he might have traded her for drugs or sold her for drugs or favors to someone who he's afraid to turn on or he's just too loyal to turn on. So someone he's more loyal to than his own children. And he doesn't seem like he's very loyal to his children. These parents are very different than all the other parents we've looked at on the channel. So at this point, all possibilities are open until I learn more about the narrative that Don is pushing. Because right now, Candace is pushing a kidnapping narrative. She just said there's bears on the property. Why is a bear taking Summer out of the question? Why did it have to be a kidnapping? And even the coyotes that are around here. All right, now she's saying there's also coyotes. Why could a coyote not have dragged Summer off? Why is that off the table for her? It's only two weeks into the search. Why is that off the table? That's what's so strange about this. If you look at the parents I've analyzed whose children actually went missing, they considered every possibility if a kidnapper took them, please return my kid. If the kid ran away, please come home. We're looking for you. You know, Just find anyone and tell them who you are so you can come home. If they wandered off, if, if uh, they fell into a river, they left every possibility open because they did not know what happened. When people narrow in on a narrative this early in investigation, you should be on alert that you might be getting manipulated. You might be in the middle of someone trying to hoax you. Well, whoever has my daughter, I pray and hope that they have not harmed her. In right here. So in the same sentence that she talks about bears and coyotes on the property, she says, well, whoever has my daughter, certain that someone has her daughter. Remember, these four signs of a hoax. Conclusiveness. She is conclusive that her daughter has been kidnapped. She didn't say, for example, there's coyotes and bears on the property. So I'm worried that that might have happened to her. Or if someone took my daughter, if you have her, please return her. I'll pay you whatever you want. Um, you know, or look into your heart and, and just please return Summer. That's not what we see here. So even if she actually believes, so let's say there was actually evidence that Summer was kidnapped. She's not acting like the parent of a kid who's kidnapped. And they bring her back to us safe and sound. 
and just turned, I mean, go to the FBI, the police, and uh, clear it up. I mean, I don't know, it seems kind of elusive. It's really strange that I've never seen this truck, and I've never heard of it until just recently. All right, so apparently they're talking about some truck that was on the property. So, okay. All right, if this, a truck has been mentioned being on the property, now we have a little bit of an idea of why they might be considering that someone took Summer. But the conclusiveness about it still does not make sense because they're not even entertaining the possibility of a bear or a coyote, things that they brought up themselves. But I wish they would come forward and explain themselves. I mean, if you're not a suspect, at least come forward and say what you've seen. She was a tomboy. I shaved my head. She wanted to have her head shaved like... All right. I've seen some posts about this. And I actually saw when I was researching this uh, yesterday, a video that Peter Hyatt did saying that Summer's head was shaved. So she had a shaved head the day she went uh, missing. And I talked about this in the live chat on my last video. So let's listen to what they say about that. And I'll explain to you what a shaved head means on a potentially abused kid. And it is, uh, it's not easy to hear. It's probably the sickest thing I will have discussed on the channel to date. All right. And stuff like this is the reason I avoided true crime for a year. Because we're not just looking at how to spot liars here. We're actually looking at how to spot very, very um, scary lies. Life and death lies. I mean, if you're not a suspect, at least come forward and say what you've seen. So as you listen, consider why... Summer's head would have been shaved. Why would you shave a five-year-old girl's head? She was a tomboy. I shaved my head. She wanted to have her head shaved like me and the boys did. All right, so Candace is saying that Summer wanted her head shaved because she's a tomboy, right? So she asked for it. She tried to shave her head she tried in to the shave back her head and, and make it. Uh, I think you can see it in some of the pictures. And it was getting out of control, so she, we decided to shave her head off and let it grow back long. And she shaved her head to, to so she wouldn't feel bad. All right. This is how you know these are not sophisticated liars, which is why I'm so surprised that they haven't been called out yet. I don't know why other analysts of big channels haven't called these people out yet. Um, based on the comments I've seen, I've never, I've not actually watched the behavior panel video about them. But according to the comments, people are telling me they went easy on these people. They said some were asked to have her head shaved. Don just said Candace shaved her head so Summer wouldn't feel bad about it. And you can actually see him stuttering and self-interrupting because he knows he just screwed up that cover story. So notice how he catches himself. They said Summer asked to have her head shaved. Then Don, a very likely, very low IQ. These are low IQ people. Low IQ. Immediately screws up that cover story by saying that Candace got her head shaved so Summer wouldn't feel bad. So if Summer asked to have her head shaved, there's no reason she should feel bad about having her head shaved. So I, we've already been trapped in a lie and we're two minutes into the interview. So if Summer did not ask to have her head shaved, why do you shave a little girl's head in a house where I believe she was being abused by her father? Why would they shave her head? Why would Candace shave Summer's head? Ask yourself that. And I know that I and the people on my channel, uh, people who follow me, are normal people, right? well-adjusted people. So the answer might not jump out at you. And I'm going to give you the answer. But just see if you can come up with it yourself and put yourself into the headspace 
um, because that is the only way to catch people like this. You have to consider things that are so beyond your view of the world um, to figure out why certain things happen in these situations. To shave her head she tried in to the back her head and, herself. and make it. So they're claiming she tried to save herself, her head herself. Now listen to what Don says. Listen to how quickly he screws up and how he stutters and tries to self-correct. It, uh, I think you can see it in some of the pictures. And it was getting out of control. So she, we decided to shave her head off and let it grow back long. And she shaved her head to, to, so she wouldn't feel bad. So he screwed up and he knows it. He just stuttered and tried to self-correct. That's why I would love to be able to depose them. I would love to have them in a situation where I could have my way with them. Have them under oath so that if they lie to me, I can pin them down on it and actually punish them for telling me lies. But like everybody uh, who's seen my channel knows or in the comments, people are just too smart to do a one-on-one -on -one with me if uh, they know I'm going to go out to get them. And, uh, but, but it didn't bother at this point. Well, we knew, I knew right away that she was abducted, you know. All right, so more conclusiveness. I knew right away that she was abducted. How could you know that? How could you know she was abducted? Same with the McCanns. Kate says, I went into the bedroom. I knew right away she was abducted. How do you know that? How do you know they didn't wander off? The conclusiveness is the sign of a hoax, as I always say. When people are this conclusive, you need to be on red alert that they are trying to fool you. And apparently they have fooled people. And I think the reason they fool people is because, um, so this is important. I think the reason that people didn't suspect the McCanns, for example, or if they did suspect the McCanns, they didn't want to speak about it is because no one likes to accuse the parents of doing something to their kid. Because if you're wrong, it looks really bad. And I've actually had people uh, comment on my videos. DED, how, how dare you accuse these parents? You don't know what happened for sure. How, uh, what if you're wrong, DED? I don't come to my conclusions lightly, first of all. And secondly, if I'm wrong, if I'm proven wrong, I'll own it. But the other thing is people can be shamed into backing off their opinions. And I think that's what those comments tried to do. And I'll show you an example. For example, I got this comment a little while ago. And I feel like comments like this, and I'm going to read it in a second here if you're listening on podcast mode. Comments like this, I believe, scare off other analysts because they can be shamed into backing off their opinion or they have big sponsors. And so they're scared of losing their sponsors by saying something uh, that's politically insensitive. On my channel, I sell my own products. I sell my own merch. If you want to support the channel by buying Deception Deck or if you, if you want to get a hat like I have here, let me know and I'll put it on, on DeceptionDeck.com. I'm supported by my viewers, by the members, by the ad revenue my videos get when you guys watch them and share them. And I thank you for that. But other people can be scared off their opinions by sponsors. They can be scared off their opinions by being ashamed. Or they can be uh, blackmailed, right? I don't use my real name. So no one can try to dox me or get personal with me. And if they try, it will be the biggest mistake they've ever made. But here, for example, here's a comment. You're making money out of someone's grief. It's shameful, don't you think? So I think this comment was on my Ramsey's video or McCann video. So someone trying to shut down my opinion that the parents were responsible. Or in the Ramsey's case, the my opinion that at the very least the parents covered up their daughter's murder and they tried to shame me off my opinion. And I feel like that can work on, on some channels like behavior panel. I do believe they are subject to shame because they use their real names. Um, they have sponsors. 
And here's why I responded. And it applies to that video as well as this video, as well as any video I've ever made or will make. I only care about two things, the truth and teaching people how to spot it before misinformation becomes too powerful. I can't be shamed. I can't be bought and I can't be blackmailed. Capish? So in the case of Summer Wells, I'm going to tell you right now, I think that both of these parents are addicts. I think both of them are low IQ. And I believe both of them abused the hell out of Summer. So when they um, are able to fool people who interview them, it's because they are manipulative. Every drug addict, every alcoholic, Every low life is manipulative because that's how they survive. They don't survive on their wit or their industry or their skills or their smarts. They survive at the mercy of others by shaming other people into giving them charity or into being afraid to accuse them just because it'd be so obvious. They live in a trailer in Tennessee and they shaved their daughter's head. And in the Don Wells video I watched, he tried to blame Summer's disappearance on his sons. These are low lives. And low lives, if their kid goes missing, the truth is likely staring us in the face. Statistically, they did it. Or, they, or it happened because they were negligent. And I don't feel bad about saying that about them. But I feel like some people would feel bad because it would it's so obvious, it seems so stereotypical that they restrain themselves from saying what's totally obvious. Well, to me, these parents are not the victims. There's only one victim here, and that's Summer. And people got confused with the McCanns as well. There's only one victim in the Madeline McCann case, and that's Madeline. And when I'm looking for the truth, I'm looking for the truth for the actual victim. And there's a reason that in all the community polls I do, little girls always rise to the top of the poll. Little girls who terrible things happen to. And I think that's because other analysts or the police, the detectives have failed those little girls because they're too scared to accuse the parents. Or the ones who are brave enough to accuse the parents, correctly in my opinion, get pushed off the case by politicians or media are other people who are too cowardly to point out the obvious. So if, let's say, Don starts crying here or telling us how hard his life is, I don't care, right? And that's how you have to go into it. And that's one reason I ignore body language. I ignore all forms of manipulation. All right, so I know that was a bit of a rant, but I feel like in this case, from the comments I've seen, it had to be said. These parents, in my opinion, are clearly guilty. It's, it, this is almost the biggest laydown case I've seen. Um, and in my opinion, the Nicola Bully case is also a laydown. It looks like a woman who killed herself or had an accident in a river, and I posted as much on X. Um, so uh, maybe I'll do a post about this on YouTube about the Nicola Bully case. But regarding Nicola Bully, it looks like someone who fell into the water and got her foot or a piece of clothing or hand trapped between two rocks and just got drowned that way. And that can happen in very gentle currents. You don't need white water tides. And I know that's a possibility because I used to go white water rafting all the time. And the number one rule is if you fall out of the boat, do not try to stand up because if there's a rocky bed and something gets trapped between the rocks, you can get held down under the water. All it takes is a minute. Um, and all it takes is one article of clothing or one appendage or one limb to just get trapped under something and you can drown. You don't need very deep water. You don't need very heavy rapids. Okay, so to me, this looks like a lay down. The only part I'm curious about is what actually happened to Summer. The parents to me are guilty. Now I just want to know how guilty and what happened to her. Oh, I knew that right away. And that's what I told them from the beginning. But they have to... They have to go through their, you know, I forget the word. Investigation. They have to do one step at a time, I guess. But I'm sorry that they had to spend so many man hours in these woods and everything. I've seen them limping and everything else. You know. 
So now he's apologizing to the police who are looking for his daughter. That's bizarre. No, I not feel for him. But... In fact, this is also in the deception deck. This might be ingratiation, where he's being very complimentary and nice to the police because he wants them to like him. And this is the sign of a guilty person, usually. In missing persons cases or emergencies, you'd be surprised just how rude the parents are to the police. And it's actually a red flag with 911 dispatchers if someone calls about a missing child and even says something as uh, minute as hello or thank you or please, you'd be surprised. You might think, well, if my kid went missing, of course I'd say please find my daughter to the police. Um, in real situations where a kid's missing and has been missing for a little while, actual parents of missing children are very um, impatient with the police because they've not found their kid. And on that 911 call, the, when in the heat of an emergency, people get very primal in real emergencies. They don't say hello. They say, my kid's missing. Help me. They don't say please. They don't say thank you. And in fact, even something as small as not using a contraction. Like, for example, I cannot find my kid is a red flag. Just because when people are that primal in the heat of an emergency, they tend to use contractions. Like, I can't find my kid. Help me. Get here now. That's a real emergency. Not, officer, if you have the time, please find my kid. And I'm so sorry it's taking you guys so long to find her. Uh, can I offer you some iced tea? That's a red flag. Don apologizing to the police for looking for his kid and talking about how he feels bad that they're limping is a red flag. I just wish there was a way that neighbors could search neighbors' houses and then if they're not willing, you know, get a search warrant or something. But there's just no way you can search every single house, you know, and the eastern United States or whatever. But I wish there was a way. Just thankful for the person or persons that's doing that, you know, out of love, and trying it. trying to get information and trying to get her found. And we thank them from the bottom of our hearts. It means and, a lot. And we thank uh, everybody who's trying so hard and praying so hard. And she's an awesome young lady, and uh, we just want her back. But, yeah. yeah, there's always going to be haters, you know, and, you know, it's always going to be that way in this world. And we just want to focus on the the good friends and Christian people that are. So we have a dog barking in the background. Did they hear a dog barking the day someone went missing during those two minutes? That, those are the type of details you would expect her to be reminiscing about. But we didn't hear anything like that. trying to help us and praying for us and praying for summer and uh, we thank them from the bottom of our hearts and that's the, the kind of people we try to relate with and so also notice how he says people praying for us and then praying for summer so he and candace are the priority summer is the secondary priority and we saw this with the ramses as well on the 911 call we found a note and our daughter is gone and in that case um, John Bonet was already dead. That's why she was a secondary priority. Here we see Summer as a secondary priority again. Another indicator that they might know that Summer is dead. And if you saw my first Summer Wells video, as uh, sad as it is, that might be one of the better outcomes for her. Because the other outcome that, that is possible in this situation is that she was sold, that she was trafficked. And that is a hell I don't even want to consider for a little girl. And that's the sort of stuff that I is the reason I didn't do true crime on the channel for so long, because I don't even want to uh, think about it, let alone listen to words about it and, uh, and uh, detect the truth about that. trying to help us and praying for us and praying for summer. And uh, we thank them from the bottom of our hearts. And that's the, the 
kind of people we try to relate with and socialize with. So we don't know anything about, you know, no red truck or we hardly know many of our neighbors. I mean, because we just try to be around good people. I mean, and we do have good people in this area. We found. So let's also listen to the hedging language. We try to be around good people. What does that mean? That means that they don't necessarily consort with good people. It means they try to. Right. If I only hung out with good, reputable people, I'd say we only hang out with good people. I wouldn't say I try to only hang out with good people. And this is, was another thing I noticed in my first video about Summer Wells, where I believe that Don and Candace have friends in very low places. Dangerous people, people who might say, hey, give me your daughter or I'll kill you both because you owe me money. Or, all right, you, you can't afford your fix this week? Give me your daughter. Rent her out to me. And then something happens to her. Well, cover it up. Not my problem. And if you turn on me, I'll kill both of you and your other kids. So out here in this, things could ha be happening that would not even occur to us um, people who are here watching YouTube videos and have the luxury of, of watching videos about education and improving our lives, which is why it's so hard to put yourself into, the, and for me, to put myself into the headspace of people like this. But it's the only way to understand the context is to get into their heads. Also, um, just to touch upon why, because I forgot to do this, did you figure out why Summer's head was shaved? There's a few reasons. One is it could just be punishment, like we saw in my Ruby Frankie video, where she did sadistic, bizarre punishments to her children. And one of those could include shaving the kid's head in order to humiliate them. The other options are even worse. So the second option is that Candace shaved Summer's head in order to make her less attractive to Don because she knows that Don abuses her. So she tried to make Summer less attractive in order, in an attempt to spare Summer some abuse until the hair grew back. And it's interesting that they talked about how the head was the hair was shaved in the back first. The third option, which is also sick, and I can't believe I'm saying this, is that Candace shaved Summer's head because she's in competition with Summer for Don's attention. So Candace, out of jealousy for the attention that Summer gets, shaved uh, Summer's head. All right, let's see how far. So we're about a third of the way through this video. Let's finish this up um, in a part two on this video. And now let's look at some of the top comments from my last Summer Wells video so we can see what insights uh, my uh, subscribers brought to this case. All right, so here's my here's my last Summer Wells video. Can suspects project their guilt? And we're just going to quickly go through the top comments together um, so I can highlight stuff that you guys pointed out that rose to the top of the pile. But I also did have one comment of my own that I put in here, so I'm just going to note it since it's something I recognize after I posted the video. So at 31 minutes and 50 seconds in Can Suspects Project Their Guilt?, Don quoted Summer as saying, but daddy, I only want to be with you. And I commented, if that's an actual quote from Summer, but is an indication that there's um, a comparison. So if she actually said, but daddy, I only want to be with you. It means that daddy was trying to make her be with someone else. And she was protesting, but daddy, I only want to be with you. So if it's an actual quote from, from Summer, the context and the person she's comparing Don to is unclear. The possibility of being a verbatim quote in the situation 
could be Don was exploiting her. So literally pimping her out to another man. And she was protesting that by saying, but daddy, I only want to be with you. So if that was a verbatim quote, it could be an admission by Don through him, through hearsay, through him quoting Summer, that A, he abused her because she said, I only want to be with you. And B, that he pimped her out because she said, but I only want to be with you. And that idea was so disturbing to me that I didn't even pick up on it on my first listen through in the video. All right, so the second comment is from longtime member Alicia B., one of the best uh, detectives from the member section. All the, all the people in the member section have amazing insights. And if you're a member, um, I try to read every single one of your comments. So thank you for being a member and supporting the channel. But also thank you for watching the videos, learning the lessons, and applying them. It makes your comments even more interesting to read. and actually gives me those aha eureka moments um, that you guys get when you listen to me say something that that strikes you as pretty clever, right? Or something you didn't recognize before. All right. So Alicia's B's comment, um, Alicia B's comment is, thank you for this. Poor little summer needs more attention. Crimes against children are particularly difficult to process. And I agree. I think the reason that, um, like I said earlier in my earlier uh, little rant about how analysts fail little children, especially little girls. It's because they consider how bad it would look if they're wrong. So they don't want to go too hard against the parents. Well, in my case, if I spot the deception in their language and I stack up enough poker chips to feel confident that they are lying, that they are hoaxing, I've got no problem um, stating my opinion that they're guilty. And already here, we're not very deep into the Summer Well series. We're just getting started. As you know, in my McCann's video, when we were only two videos in, I knew very little. I was just shaping my ideas. We'd only picked out a little bit of leakage about nautical references. 15 videos in, um, if you watch that whole series, you can see how much more confident we are in things as minute as why the case got derailed. Um, the most likely places Madeline might have been left, and being so confident that we could rule out Christian B as a suspect. And I feel like the same thing will happen here with Summer Wells because these parents are very unsophisticated liars. And unlike the McCanns, they were not smart enough to be reticent about their story until they had it perfectly scripted. Already here, we can see contradictions about why Summer's hair was shaved and clear signs of skipping over time. For example, about those two minutes. And then if you are one of the people who voted for uh, Nicola Bully on my community poll, I will do a video about Nicola Bully, but just be aware that from everything I've seen, unless I see something uh, totally, totally different than what I've seen so far, to me, it looks like a straightforward um, suicide or accident. It doesn't look like some big conspiracy theory to me. But then again, I, I've only read the mainstream news about it. But I couldn't find any good interviews that would indicate anything else. So I am aware. If I, only, if I were to only read mainstream articles about the McCanns, I would be totally wrong about that situation. However, the McCanns and their interviews look deceptive right away. Whereas um, when I see stuff with Paul Ansel, um, it... it doesn't look particularly deceptive to me. He's not, it's not like he's pushing a hoax. He's not pushing a narrative. All right, let's see here. The third uh, comment from love to love them. I'm so happy you are delving into Summer's parents. There are a bunch of us who have followed this case from the very beginning who have always thought they covered up her death or sold her. According to his stepsister, he tried selling his son for drugs years ago. All right, so regarding all this sort of stuff, let's say he did try to, Don did try to sell a kid before. That tracks with my analysis so much, it almost seems too on the nose. Like I would need a fact check about that. It's almost too obvious. If there was record of him trying to sell a kid before, 
And then we saw the language in that first video I analyzed, where even I, someone who hates conspiracy theories, said it's a possibility he sold her. Um, it's so on the nose. I don't see how the police wouldn't be all over that. Police or FBI would not be all over that. So I, I do need some sort of fact checking about claims like that. And then here's another uh, comment I just wanted to highlight from Flip Flop. So glad you're covering this case. I follow since June 2021. I found your channel from Ziggy. And I just want to say that ever since I started covering this case, I've had lots of people email me and DM me uh, wanting to collaborate with me on the case. And here's the thing about that. I work alone. And it's not because I don't like other people. It's simply because I'm aware how easy it is to get biased. So if you do want to collab with me or, um, uh, you know, sh share opinions, feel free to react to my videos. And there's actually a great little example right here on the right side of the screen. You can see what Pat Brown did to when she, uh, she and I were collaborating back and forth. Basically, we're just reacting to each other's videos. That way, we each have complete control over the editing process, um, over what's said, what's not said. And we're able to make sure that all the caveats we want to insert into our stories um, and into our analysis is totally clear to protect ourselves and others. So as you can see here in this thumbnail, Pat Brown did a video about me, Welcome Deception Detective to the Never Ending McCann. Um, I think it was like McCann Case or something like that. And if you want to collab with me, that's a great way to do it, uh, to hop into the live stream when I'm doing a premiere. I'm always on in the live stream, live stream during the premieres of my videos. Or just make a video, tag me, and um, if, if you're making good points and pointing out stuff that I might have missed or stuff that would add to my analysis, I'll make a video replying to you. Uh, that way we can exchange ideas uh, without losing the important nuances and context um, about our particular fields of analysis. And like I've said, I've been invited onto uh, Sean Atwood's channel. I just want to have complete control about how my videos are framed, the, the risks I take with what I say so I don't get anyone else in trouble, uh, and uh, just so my analysis is not influenced by anyone else. So it's nothing against anybody. I think Ziggy did a great job reacting to my video. I thought that was cool. I actually hopped into her live chat and, you know, and waved hello and said hi to her viewers. Um, so if you are big into this case and you want my attention or, or want me to give you feedback on something that you might have to say, uh, that's a great way to do it. Just mention me or tag me and I'll do it. Also, I try to be totally transparent with everything I do. So, for example, Pat Brown and I never exchanged private messages with each other. Everything we did was out in the open on X or in our videos. So if you email me, it's it's very likely, A, that it will just get re reported to junk, um, or B, I'll just address you the way I'm addressing here. Please do it in public. Um, that way, everything can be seen by my subscribers and your subscribers from square one. And I think that's just the most transparent way to do it. That's been my policy since day one. I'm transparent about everything except for my identity because um, if I put myself at, be at the risk of being doxxed or shamed or canceled, then the first thing to go will be the strength of my opinions because I'll have to pull them back, kind of like how behavior panel has to walk back their opinions and tone them down because they use their real names. They're at risk of cancellation. They're at risk of crazy people coming after them. Um, it's just, it's, it's more risk than it's worth. I made this channel to teach people how to spot lies. I didn't make it uh, to uh, become a celebrity or anything along those lines. So I know those guys love having their names out there and writing books and, and all that sort of stuff. That's not my interest. My interest is to teach people how to spot lies and manipulation before it's too late. And the way to do that is to make videos you'll actually watch, um, which is why I do the community polls, and insert the lessons into those videos. If I just make a lesson, uh, a video like a, a classroom teaching you something, it's very unlikely you'll actually watch the entire video. It'll be too boring. 
but if I tie it to a case that you're passionate about and uh, makes me passionate about, about analyzing it, then the lessons hit a lot harder. And as I've seen from the comments, lots of you guys have used stuff from my videos in your personal lives uh, to catch liars or to realize that someone was gaslighting you in a past relationship um, or a boss was manipulating you into doing things that you shouldn't have been doing. And that uh, is all the gratification I need from the channel. It means that uh, what I'm doing is working. All right, so in part two, we'll look at the rest of this video. We'll continue with this video. If you're a member of the channel, um, do uh, consider watching ahead if you want so that you can have some comments for the live stream. If you're not a member, uh, please do consider becoming a member. It helps support the channel. And I throw in extra content into the members section. And if you want to support the channel, consider picking up uh, a copy of the Deception Deck, which is my 52 favorite um, rules for spotting deception boiled down to flashcards so you can practice them and learn them and memorize them so you can use them on the fly the same way I do. So you can spot liars and manipulators in real time. Until next time, stay true.